a history of diversity and inclusion at Harper College. The 1960s and 70s. By the time Harper College had opened its doors for the first time in September of 1967, the founders had hired a group of seasoned and enthusiastic educators engaged in the exciting task of creating from scratch a brand new college in a rapidly expanding suburban corridor. As you can see here, that first group of faculty and administrators were mostly male and were entirely white. The truth of the matter was, like many suburban areas in the United States of the 60s and 70s, Chicago's northwest suburbs were demographically not diverse, and the composition of the administration, the faculty, and to a large extent, the student body reflected this. As Harper welcomed its first classes of students, the rest of the country was undergoing tremendous social and political changes. With the counterculture at the height of its influence, young people began to find their voice. In October of 1969, Harper students gathered as part of a moratorium protesting the Vietnam War. Inspired by the example of civil rights, other communities also joined the freedom movement led by figures like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. College officials and student activities programmers made a conscious effort to bring diverse voices to campus, including activists and performers engaged in the political controversies and social struggles of the day. Going back as far as 1969, we had Jesse Jackson and Julian Bond, who were civil rights uh, leaders in, in the movement, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, the poet, Duke Ellington, Muddy Waters, Ramsey Lewis, Maya Angelou, Dick Gregory, the comedian activist, and we had him here twice, once in the 80s and once in the early 2000s. Oprah Winfrey, uh, Buddy Guy, um, Lee Young Lee, who is a Chinese American poet, uh, Chuck D from Public Enemy, uh, Sherman Alexi, a Native American author, uh, we had him here in 2000. I skipped over Jose Feliciano, but that was a huge program for our Latino uh, population. We've had Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, uh, Daryl McDaniels of Run DMC, Dr. Reza Aslan, it was Dr. John Carlos. In 1973, prompted by new federal Title IX requirements mandating gender equality in athletics, the college quickly restructured its programs to permit women athletes to compete with other schools. The 1980s. As the 1980s dawned, a new generation of activists came into their own. While the government seemed to turn a blind eye to the AIDS crisis, organizations like ACT UP challenged the status quo. And looking back to the social justice movements of the 60s, called on the nation to treat all citizens with dignity and respect. This included Americans with disabilities whose staging of sit-ins and protests in Denver, Washington, San Francisco, and elsewhere in the late 70s had sparked new attention to issues of access and inclusion for this long neglected group. You know, back in the late 80s, um, we had one international students club which was the catch-all for any students of color. and. Uh, it took us some time, but as we started to do these sensitivity to diversity workshops that we provided, um, we saw how student groups started to break away. So we started to have a BSU. We had a black student union the first time that we ever had a, a, a separate group. And then the Indian Pakistani group, and then the largest group on campus was our Latinos Unidos. The 1990s. As the Cold War came to an end, and as the century entered its final decade, the United States was as diverse as ever. While the nation entered into a period of relative peace and prosperity, the social movements that had gained traction in the 1960s turned their attention to transforming colleges and universities. Harper College President Paul Thompson brought the Preferred Future Program to the college. The goal was to increase diversity in staffing and student programming. As a new uh, graduate from DePaul University uh, in 1991, I was hired at Harper. I think when I started working here, there was doubt about 
whether students can um, be successful or not. But I think over the years as we graduate and support students to transfer, I think the whole viewpoint is different. The 2000s. During the presidency of Robert Bruder, Harper College established a new Center for Multicultural Learning and a Multicultural Fellows Program. The influence of the Fellows Program, the CML, and other campus entities extended in many directions through the efforts of individual administrators, faculty members, and newly formed diversity interest groups. I recruited international deaf speakers for nine years from different countries to come on campus. It was really wonderful for our broader community, for our deaf students, our ASL and ITP students. I think for me it's my opportunity to lead by example. You know, I think I always laugh and say that I have the triple whammy, disabled, Latina, and women. And so if I can do it and overcome uh, the challenges that I've been presented with, I think it serves for people to see that challenges can be overcome. And it changes people's attitudes about disabilities and about, you know, being a Latina. 2008, a way forward. In 2008, Chicago's very own Barack Obama became the first African-American president of the United States. The leader of a movement that was seeking change, Obama was an inspiring symbol for young people across the nation. In 2013, President Kenneth Ender convened a task force to address ongoing issues regarding diversity and inclusion at Harper College. This launched a diverse faculty fellows program, employee resource groups, and the establishment of an executive level diversity officer titled the Special Assistant to the President for Diversity and Inclusion. In 2018, nearing the end of the task force recommendations and Dr. Ender's tenure, Harper College embarked on a search for its next president. In 2019, Harper College welcomed its sixth president. Welcome to our fall 2019 all-campus meeting. It's such a privilege to serve as your sixth president. And Harper College continues efforts towards a diverse and inclusive campus.